Hey everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, we're going to get started here. Um, I'm John Affleck, I, uh, I run the John Curley Center for Sports Journalism at Penn State, which this year is celebrating its 20th anniversary. And um, as kind of our keynote speaker for our 20th anniversary, we brought in uh, a fantastic feature writer for ESPN and a Penn State alum from just before the Curley Center was founded, Brian Hawkinson. And um, honestly, I said this to him at dinner. Um, I don't, I don't know if he's the, I don't know if he's the best sports writer Penn State has ever produced, but it's him and Verducci, and it's pretty tight. So, um, so we're really glad to have, we're really really glad to have Ryan here. Uh, I, there, there are forms here with his, there are um, handouts here with his. Biography, which I think most of you got, but I will just say um, Ryan's from Pennsylvania, um, grew up not far from Harrisburg, and uh, is a 2001 graduate of Penn State, went to ESPN as an intern immediately following, and has stayed there ever since. Um, he's had a bunch of positions there where he's either been, you know, uh, a long form, he was with ESPN the magazine for quite some time where he was either an editor or, uh, or a writer. And for time, he was the college football editor, which is probably a total fire hose to manage. Um, and then since uh, about 2018 or so, he's just been straight up national writer, straight, straight up writer. A uh, year and a half, I've been writing. Okay. Not very long. And, um, but this year, um, there's an anthology of the best American sports writing, and one of his pieces on uh, the history of the porta potty um, is, uh, was, uh, was selected uh, for that anthology. Ryan's got a particular talent, uh, and we'll talk about this at some length. Um, he's got a particular talent for the non famous person who gets involved in sports, even in sort of a tangential way. And has um, a, an amazing impact on their lives, and so um, he tells very human stories. He tells stories that are conversational but deep, um, and so they're 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 fun to read and fantastic to to get through. And you feel like you've been on a journey and you know people, and there isn't much else that writing can really do. So uh, I'm going to get out of his way. The way we're going to do this tonight is Ryan's actually going to read, read from a couple of his uh, pieces of figuring that some of our, our um, 260 students may not have had a chance to really get uh, a great introduction to him yet. So we're, he's going to read from a couple of pieces, then we're going to start and we've got, a, a, I'll prime the pump so to speak with a couple of questions and he's got a few things to say, and then we're just going to open it up and um, uh, I've had very We've had very few guests here who are just so open and easy to talk to, so I really encourage you to just chime in. So please welcome Ryan Hawkinson. Thank you. That was uh, way too. My ego is expanding uh, quickly. Thank you for that. That was very nice of you. Uh, so I think I'll read from. I wrote, I um, picked out two things, a couple paragraphs each from stories that uh, I'm pretty proud of and. Um, I picked these two readings because I think they emphasize two things that were either said to me and I didn't listen when I was in college, or I never, never said to me. So I wish someone had said to me. Um, but I wrote a story about Patrick Mahomes uh, about a year ago. And, um, you know, the, my, my process for that was like, we just were sitting around thinking, boy, we should do a Patrick Mahomes story. He's really good. Uh, so it wasn't very deeply thought out. Uh, but I went through his uh, his life, I read his Wikipedia page, and I read a hundred stories about him. And one of the things that jumped out at me was that it's hard to fathom this being the case, but in seventh grade, he started competing for the starting quarterback position at White House. Uh, he went to White House High School, so he was a junior high football player. He started competing in seventh grade with his best friend to be a quarterback for White House. And they competed nonstop for the next four years. He was in a quarterback battle. So I, in my story, I called it the longest quarterback battle in the history of football. 
And right now, when you think about Patrick Mahomes, it's hard to believe that anybody was ever like neck and neck with him, but he was, and it was his best friend. And so I thought, wow, what a window into Patrick Mahomes. You know, he's one of the most likable players in the NFL. And one of the reasons why it turns out is because he had to maintain a best friendship while battling this guy. They would alternate series. You can imagine your best friend right now, you and him or her competing for the same job for four years in a row. It's probably not going to work out too well for you guys. So he ended up pulling, he ended up winning the starting job. And so I wrote about the moment when he won the job and how both beautiful and heartbreaking it was. So White House opened the 2012 season 2 0 with Ryan Cheatham and Patrick Mahomes again splitting snaps. But in the third game against rival Sulphur Springs, Mahomes started the first half in steady rain. He managed the first half with no turnovers, no botched snaps, no fumbled handoffs. The other school's skill position guys kept having slips and dropped balls, and coaches were impressed with the way Mahomes had White House chugging along. At halftime, uh, I forget the guys, Adam Cook was the coach. Adam Cook pulled Ryan Cheatham and Patrick Mahomes aside and told them that the coaching staff wanted to stick with Mahomes because of the slip conditions. But they both had a feeling that Mahomes had just won a quarterback battle that had gone on for four plus years. Cheatham exchanged the look with Mahomes. It's the kind of look between two very good friends where no words are said because no words are needed. They were both happy and sad, all mixed up together. This is a quote from Ryan Cheatham. He said, at the time, I wouldn't have admitted it, but I knew Patrick was better than me. I could see it. Mahomes led White House to another win. After the game, there was a sense in the locker room that Ryan Cheatham's quarterback career was over. As the room cleared out, only Cheatham and his coach, Adam Cook, remained. They hugged and started to cry. Ryan Cheatham said, my pride hurts. And Cook said, I know, Ryan, it's going to hurt for a while. But you have a new opportunity now. You have an entire team that respects you, and we will have a new role for you. You can succeed and you can help Patrick su succeed. And so that was the launch, that was the beginning of what we know now as Patrick Mahomes. And his best friend, who he beat up for that job, moved over to wide receiver and became his best wide receiver. He really sucked it up. And it, it's really like, when you talk about emotional intelligence, it takes a lot of emotional intelligence to be an NFL quarterback these days. And I thought that that was like a real good launch point. And I picked that reading out because one of the thing that I, that I have really learned is that um, if I could be a really good writer, or a really good reporter, I think I would choose reporter because you can cover up a lot. I don't think I'm a great writer. I just don't, I think I'm not that artful. Sometimes I read words put together by other writers where I'm like, I can't come up with that. But I can report the living shit out of stuff. Like I will call 10 people because every time I've ever called eight people for a story and then I've called a ninth, the story gets better. I've never thought, boy, that just took a big step back. You know, and so I think if you, even if you think I'm not the greatest writer, if you bust your butt and call more people, it, it usually stacks up to a really, really good story. So I, I wanted to emphasize that idea of like reporting versus writing. I thought it was just all one big thing. You just sit down and write a great story. But I, for that Mahomes story, um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I talked to 25 people, but I, I probably spent a good 20 hours on the phone with. I talked to at least five of his high school teammates. I talked to five, six, seven, eight of his high school coaches. I mean, I didn't just call his high school football coach. I called his junior high coach. I called his quarterbacks coach. And at the end of it, everybody, I told some students this earlier, um, maybe the best question I ever asked people is at the end of an interview, I said, who else should I talk to? And if it's a good interview, the person's like, well, you know who else? You know, this guy, this guy, this guy, this, his mom, whatever. And um, and so I would just encourage people, you know, I, I always think of it like a donut, like you start on the outside of the donut and you work your way in. And in the Patrick Mahomes story, it was actually a donut because in the middle was nothing. Patrick Mahomes didn't end up talking to me. He, he, you know, I had, they were entertaining the idea and it was getting close to the playoffs and it's just like, we're not going to do the interview. But I had talked to 20 people who knew him, you know, so I felt like I had the story. And so we ran it. And I think we, I think we called it the longest quarter, how Patrick Mahomes won the longest quarterback battle in, in football history. Something like that. It did really well. I'm really proud of the story. It's really hard to find. When you're writing about some of these A-list guys, it's just, like if you had to write a James Franklin story right now, it's like, Google it. There's a thousand, probably literally a thousand stories written about it. So how do you find a new angle? And um, it can be hard. And I would just, I, again, call four more people. You, it'll never hurt you. So 
that was the first thing I wanted to mention. Um, the second story I wanted to read from is uh, it's from about two years ago, but I saw these. I saw it was mostly Facebook, but it went viral on social media about this guy who one day, uh, I guess two or three years ago, he had been decided he wanted to rip up his back steps. He had these uh, he had these like uh, cement steps out back of this house, and they were falling apart. Squirrels were in there, chipmunks were in there, and his cats. He mostly tore up the steps because his cats were going nuts every morning because chipmunks were out there going in and out of these cracks in these steps. And he told his wife to finally get a day off. I'm going to tear up the steps. So he went out with a sledgehammer, and there were four steps. It was like the size. It was like not even the size. Maybe not even as big as this, whatever this is, lectern. What is that? What is that big magic wooden box? Whatever that magic. Whatever that. It, it was a little smaller than that, so not very big. And so he yanks out the first piece of cement, and he sees that underneath the cement, there's not dirt. It was sand. And within the sand was nothing but bowling balls. Just bowling ball after bowling ball. His whole back of his house, the foundation, was bowling balls and sand. And he was like, what the hell is this? And so he starts tearing it up, and he starts taking pictures and posting them on Facebook. And it was like an all-day project. And at the end of it, underneath those four or five steps, 162 bowling balls. He just had this mound of bowling balls. And so he kept taking pictures, and it became this, like, so everybody's like, what is this? Where did these balls come from? And they posted about it all day. He started his own Facebook group of the bowling ball guy, it's called. And that was kind of, it had its moment. So, like, so many things today that go viral, they, like, have their moment, and then you're on to the next thing the next day. And so I waited a couple of months, and then I called this guy up, and I went out there. And it's an unbelievable story. But when I called him, all I had was just this premise. Like, the only story I had was what I just told you. Hey, a guy found a bowling ball, so that's weird. You know, that was the extent of it. And I thought I got to find, like, a story within that. So the point that I wanted to make when I do this reading is, like, I had a good plot of a story. Like, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. But I was like, what is this story ultimately about? Like, what does it, what, somebody who doesn't care about sports or care about a guy finding bowling balls, what, what's the human part that anybody might be interested in? And I'll, I'll read to you um, part of this, where he was wondering where the bowling balls came from. Like, he was wondering where the bowling balls came from. And um, so here's a passage from that. Judy Hepler, his name was, um, his name was uh, David, uh, what is it, Osborne? David, David Olson was this guy's name. Um, but I found this woman, Judy Hepler, who had a theory about where the bowling balls came from. She lives in the area. Judy Hepler has a theory about where the bowling balls came from. She laughed out loud when she first heard about the bowling ball guy from the next town over. Her husband, Mike Hepler, had worked at the Muskegon plant for 48 years of Brunswick bowling balls. And she still remembers her husband shaking his head about the company's dumpster out back. Mike had died in 2009, but he had worked at Brunswick from the mid-1950s up through his death. He worked his way up from the maintenance crew to a job in the lab, testing bowling balls to make sure they were perfectly round and dense. For many years, that involved dropping balls onto a springy mat and seeing how high they bounced up. Once, Mike had a ball fly up and knock one of his front teeth out. If the ball did not fly back up, up above his waist, it meant the ball was defective. And at that late stage in the manufacturing process, that meant it was headed for the dumpster they had behind the factory. Employees could grab whatever they wanted from the dumpster, and so could the public. Mike had begun, begun to see homeowners pop in and take discarded bowling balls as filler for their backyards. In rural Michigan back then, Decades before Home Depot and Lowe's, dropping bowling balls and other objects into a hole wasn't as bizarre as it might sound. And I found this construction excavation expert named Fred Nolta, and he said, in my career, I've heard of skeletons, relics, doorknobs, license plates, all sorts of crap. People used to bury just about anything. Sand and bowling balls wouldn't pass any town code in 2021, but the combo is structurally sound relatively speaking. For example, most of our highways are built upon the same basic principle, with pavement over the top of a rock foundation of large stones and tiny pebbles 
that snuggle in around and underneath their bigger siblings for support. This is another quote from that guy, excavation guy. You want as many gaps as possible to be filled in. So I'll put it this way. If you throw sand in around bowling balls, I bet it would work pretty well. For a while, anyway, it's not a long-term solution. Still, Mike Kepler, this is the guy who uh, passed away and his wife Judy was talking to me for this story. Mike thought the dumpster was an awful idea. And this is a quote that he would tell his wife. He said, someday, somebody's gonna try to put in a swimming pool in their backyard and they're gonna find a bunch of bowling balls. Mike was a union guy at Brunswick and he cared deeply about his job, but he also grumbled about his job all the time. Judy remembers when their grandson was young, Mike would grab the grandson he would tell the little guy stories of how he would needle his bosses and how he'd like to get a rise out of them all the time. Then Mike would get out a family riding mower and he would bring the little boy along as he cut the grass. As David Olson, the bowling ball guy, as his posts took off in 2021, other former Brunswick employees chimed in with comments echoing what Mike had said to his wife decades before. The free yard fill-in notion has emerged as the most widely accepted theory for how David Olson ended up with 158 bowling balls that day, plus four he found later. That's, so that, that's the, the leading theory is that someone had taken three bowling balls and thrown them in there. So, But what shocked Judy Hepler about this whole thing isn't that a guy in a neighboring town found 162 bowling balls behind his house. Her husband had always said that would happen someday. No, what left her in disbelief was who found them. Because her grandson, that four-year-old who sat on her, his grandfather's lap on the riding mower and listened to all of those stories about goofing on Brunswick management, that boy was David Olson, the bowling ball guy. So this guy found all these bowling balls and started wondering where they came from. And then he realized, holy shit, my grandfather used to be the guy that threw these in the dumpster. And then he complained about it and said, some poor sucker's going to find these bowling balls. One in a billion chance, he buys a house, and it's a house that's built on bowling balls. And so I bring that I bring that example up because what I think actually I don't even know if that makes sense. It's just, it's just a great freaking story. I thought that we could all connect to this. Um, I think sometimes the best stories are just ones where you're just like I can't believe that happened. I just cannot believe that happened. And so that story when I got that moment I thought boy I actually have an ending to this story. It's not just a viral weird thing that happened. Um, so those are the two readings I I thought it was really about. Um, I also thought, like, there's a lot of things that happen. In, you all have an instance in your life where you're just like, I can't believe how small this world is, even though it's not small. And <laughs> if you find bowling balls in your yard that your grandfather was sort of partially responsible for, it's like such a wild, oh my God, this is, it is a small world. So I love that part of the story. Those are my two readings. Those are awesome. Did I get an A on my assignment? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, yeah. Um, the well, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to ask you about, but uh, before I do that, I know that you prepped and you've got some basic tips for our students uh, in their writing approach. And um, hit us with yeah, well, two of them were, were, were I just I just mentioned, um, but one thing about that bowling ball story also that I think is. Um, I tried stand-up for three years, stand-up comedy. I really sucked at it. But one of the things you learn about it is that like, if you have a really good premise and then a terrible end, it doesn't work. The end is everything. Like that's what, When you go to a comedy show, the end of whatever premise, that's what you will remember. That's what, where you're supposed to laugh. It's the punchline. And so when I write a story now, I used to just kind of be like, come up with a good lead and then just start filling in after that. And then it's like, what's my best quote to end with, you know? And the farther I've gotten in, the best stories that I've run into, when I start with thinking about the lead, I'm immediately thinking about the ending. I'm already thinking about, like, does this thing have a period at the end of the sentence or an exclamation point or what? And so I would just emphasize, I know in your classes, if you're in Comp 260, you're hearing the lead, the lead, the lead. And it's true, you, you have to get people right at the beginning. you got to get them from the first word. But man, if you write a long story and you have a crap ending, like people are gonna be mad at you. So I would emphasize when you're laying out this is how I want the story to go, if you're not thinking about the ending, I don't I don't know if you can do any, I don't know if you can write a great song, write a great story, 
or watch a great movie if the ending sucks. So I would just encourage you. I think you're, the things that you write that you're going to be the proudest of, I bet a lot of them have great endings. So I would always think about that. Um, another one is a, um, a story is better than the story. One of, and what I mean by that is I oftentimes will be like, man, I should, I'll use Patrick Mahomes again or Josh Allen. I should write a job. Look, look, let's use James Franklin. Let's keep it local. I want to write a great James. I want to write a great James Franklin. So what should I write? And then you look at his Wikipedia page. And you're like, oh, this is interesting. This happened to him when he was in high school. Then he went to this small school. And then he coached this. And then he had this injury. And you find 10 interesting things on his Wikipedia page. And you're like, and then you try, then what you can often do is just end up trying to write a really sexy version of a Wikipedia page. It's just like everything that ever happened to this guy. It's a book written as a story. And I, those things just do not, I just have not had luck with them. So what I have had a lot of luck with in the last year and a half is thinking about what's a story about the guy. That's why the, the, the Patrick Mahomes story that I wrote, it is a time capsule. It is a specific period in his life. I wrote another story about Kevin Durant that I just called it the year that changed his life. And it was just about one year in his life that I thought told the story of him. It was a really, that one, that one was, um, it really touched me because he, he transferred as a senior and um, he went to the school and he ended up getting paired with a, a kid who had, had um, uh, was an international student from Japan, didn't speak a lot of English. Durant helped him with English. This kid helped him with some of his other studies. They became best friends, lived in the basement of this, um, she probably she was, she's 97 now. I interviewed a 97 year old woman for this story. She was so sharp and so good at telling stories about 18 year old Kevin Durant. And so that story ended up just being like a story about him. But if you think about like how all of the traits about him now, him being feisty, him being I mean, Kevin Durant takes no crap from anybody. Uh, he remembers things. He holds a little bit of holding grudges, and it propels him. I found all of those little angles in, with him as an 18 year old living with this Japanese exchange student in the basement uh, of this older woman who, who had um, who had kids from this private school stay with her. So that's a story about Kevin Durant rather than like, and then he went to Texas and then he came out early and went to this team and then he went to this team. So I would encourage you, look for a story about a guy that can tell the story rather than try that Wikipedia thing. I just haven't had luck with that. Um, Next thing I, I've learned over the years is, um, I kind of talk about this with the ball and ball story, but it's great when you have a plot, like, then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and, um, but the best ones of those, the best kind of those stories, they end up being about something a little bit, a little bit bigger. I was telling him earlier um, a story that I wrote about a year ago about these two co college wrestlers who fought off a grizzly bear attack, they just were walking through the woods. They were doing this thing called horn hunting, where you gather antlers. You can sell antlers for a lot of money. Um, and they would find all these antlers. It was right off the fr on the fringe of Yellowstone National Park. And they were out getting antlers. And um, they walked. The one guy goes, hey, watch out for this bear crap. And then they just heard sticks crunching. And they turned around, and a grizzly was right on. Grizzly tackled one guy. And the other guy, his friend, is standing back there. And he's like, do I run? Because that does not look good over there at all. Do I run or do I help my friend? And so he starts throwing rocks at this bear. Doesn't impact the bear at all. It's mauling this guy. And he finally decides, I gotta help my friend. And so he jumps on the bear. He runs over and jumps on the bear's back and starts yanking on the bear's neck. And the, <laughs> the bear starts to turn. He drops down and just starts running. And he said he took one look back and he saw the grizzly take two gallops and then he was on top of him. And the bear bit down on his head and picked him up off the ground and dropped him, and then um, jumped on top of him, started mauling him. The other kid runs off to try to get help, and they end up fighting this bear off. It's like this unbelievable story. And so there was like, that story, you would read that just, to, and then what happened? Like that, then what happened, then what happened? But what I really ended up wanting to try to do is just talk about, I have a line in the story, maybe I should rip it from that, but I have a line in the story, it, it's hard to get a friend to help you move, let alone like, hey, would you ever fight a grizzly off for me? You know, and, and it's, the answer is like, no. How many times do people text you and be like, hey, you want to go? Uh, I'm so tired. It's like, no, I just don't want to go, right? And this, this guy risked his life, you know, and they ended up, this guy, he ended up um, eating a lot of plastic surgery on his face. The bear bit through his head and then through his cheek. He has a whole, there's a picture of him in the hospital with 
a bare tooth hole going through his cheek. And they actually they had to do all this dental work on him. And one of the things they found when they were doing dental work was within his teeth, they found pieces of bare teeth. So the bear just like it was crazy, and they ended up escaping and surviving. And it's a it's a gruesome it's a gruesome story. But at the end of the day, like who cares if you like sports or not? It was a story about friendship and how far would you go for your friend? I'm not moving. Like I don't care. I, you ask me to move with you tomorrow? No, I'm not doing it. Um, and I'm definitely not fighting up a grizzly. So the point of all of that is like if you can make your story about something, if you can find a, a larger human story in there. I mean, the way you described it earlier, I was honored that you said it that way, but, um, you know, my goal is to write stories that happen to be about sports that aren't, aren't maybe not aren't always just about sports, and I think that is sort of where I got with the Grizzly Bear story. Uh, the last two things, um, stuff goes viral now. I mentioned this earlier, stuff goes, I mean, how, how many viral things did you see today, probably? Like a couple, right? And by tomorrow, there'll be new things that are the big, oh, did you see this happen in Tucson, Arizona? And I, I keep a notes folder where when I see something blow up for an afternoon, I just keep a hold of it. I wait a couple months. Now I see if any stories have been written since then. Usually, no. You'd be surprised how these like momentous things happen and take over the internet for a day or two. And then just like everybody moves on. They just don't do anything else with it. I like to call that person, whoever it was, I like to call them three months later and say, tell me more about what happened that day and also tell me what has happened since then. Because getting famous overnight it oftentimes has interesting repercussions and ramifications. A lot of times good things, sometimes not. Um, I found a story that uh, it's in Best American Sports Radio this year in the honorable mention section about this little boy who his mom just posted one day that someone stole his autographs. He had gone to a baseball game at spring training. He's a Yankees fan. And he, he was super timid about asking approaching players for, for autographs. And he got up the courage. His friend helped build up his, his like confidence. And then he went down and got a bunch of Yankees autographs. And he posed for this cute little picture. He's like 10 years old of him getting his first autographs. And his parents, it was such a big deal to them because he was so shy as a, as a kid. And so he got all these autographs that day. And then they, at the end of the game, they were like, hey, let's go out to the parking lot. That's where all the Yankees players, they come out of the clubhouse and walk to the players' parking lot. We'll get more autographs there. But a lot of people had that idea. So they're hustling around out there. And at some point, he looks down and is like, where's my autograph book? And it was gone. The security was looking everywhere. They were stopping cars. Do you have my boy's autograph collection? And it was gone, right? And so this mom posts on Facebook. This is the thing on the bar. Her post, please, no questions asked. This autograph collection means so much more than whatever the dollar value is. You can name a price, we'll give it to you. No questions asked if you took it, whatever, just bring it back. It means so much to our family. So this local news anchor sees this. It blows up in, um, I forget what town in Florida, but um, it was Yankee Spring Training. It blows up, it goes viral. And so she does a report on the evening news down there and writes a story about this little boy, Elijah Blankenberg, who lost his autograph collection. And she does a story on him. And the thing that, the, the the beginnings of my story was within her story. It said, if you have any tips or have the autograph book, well, here's the address of the news station. So when I, that was the last I, that, that you ever heard about this story. And when I started calling them, what I found was the autograph collection was never returned to them. But people were so moved by this whole thing that they started driving their autograph collections down to this news station. And every day, 10, 15, 20 autograph collections would arrive. They ended up with 100 packages brought to them, mailed to them from around the world of people that were like, I understand the pain that that little guy's going through, and I want you to have mine. And they all had stories about their, this was the first autograph I ever got. And he ended up with like, it was very valuable, like if you wanted to sell it, but like the, the idea that something bad happened, they really believe someone stole the other grass, which is pretty shitty. Don't do that. That's a lesson in life. Don't do that. Um, they really believe that someone saw it and took it. It's like, oh, cool. Whatever. They they ended up, they did this thing with him where they had him come down to the news station and, and he was just flanked by all these packages. And he just started opening them up. And it changed his view of the world. Like something bad had happened. The perfect solution was that he would have gotten the book back that's his. But he didn't get it. He got something so much more. And one of the autographs, so, so he, it, was, it had a heartwarming first ending. 
And then the second ending that I found was one of the autographs he had gotten was from his favorite player, DJ Lemayu, who I don't think is very good anymore. Is he good? Is he good? Oh, who was insulted by that? I'm so sorry. Oh, a couple of people. Multiple people were bothered by that. Is he good or not good? He was really good in like 20, Okay, so he's not good anymore. He's not good anymore. Okay. We'll blame management. Either way. Not on the MVP ballot this year, but he this kid loves DJ LeMahieu, and maybe he'll come back. Uh, and he lost his DJ LeMahieu. He had asked DJ LeMahieu, despite being so nervous, can I get your autograph? And he got it at the game, and then poof, it's gone. And so this story happens, it goes viral, and it's mentioned that DJ LeMahieu um, was his favorite player. And at one point, the mom of this little boy uh, one of his neighbors says something to anybody who's a reporter in here has had a conversation like this. This mom uh, said, a friend of her, a neighbor of hers says to the mom of this little guy, she says, uh, oh, my nephew's cousin's uncle is friends with the neighbor of DJ LeMayo. So I'll, I'll get you some autographs. And the mom was like, I don't even understand who that person is that you're talking about. But yeah, sure, right? A couple weeks later, package arrives. It's from DJ Lemania. She actually knew the nephew's cousin's friend's neighbor. It actually panned out. Uh, and so he ended up with a DJ Lemania autograph directly from him. So it just, it was this wild story that, sorry, I'm throwing my phone. Um, it's an example of when you see something kind of blow up, you'll be surprised how fast it's forgotten. But you'll also be surprised when, if you are able to put together a story, the, the audience is already there. They were interested the first time. I like the story where you click it and you and you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. And you can add a new wrinkle to that. So, uh, so look for viral stuff that will disappear quickly is how I would think it. We all look forward to the story about Travis Kelsey. Uh, I do have some Travis Kelsey ideas that I'm working on, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything else. My, my daughter's here tonight and she, I think she, they just, my kids, I have three daughters, they all hit it. Somehow meet Taylor Swift through <laughs> Travis Kelsey. <laughs> we'll see if I can do it, I don't know. Um, the last thing, and this is a short one, is that I used to write out questions. You know, James Franklin, why did you go to, what was the small school you went to, Elizabethtown? East Stroudsburg. East Stroudsburg? Yeah, but didn't you coach at Elizabethtown or something? Oh, maybe not. Maybe I'm making that up. Um, yeah, he did, didn't he date Taylor Swift for a while? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so he went to East Stroudsburg. Um, I used to write out, like, Coach Franklin, why did you choose East Stroudsburg? What was it about? I would have a whole list. And I, I still kind of think like that when I go into an interview, but I think about topics more than questions. Because when I was just writing out questions and reading them, even if they're good questions, you're not really listening. You'll be surprised when you, if you're like zeroed in and you're just, let me ask James Franklin about college. And that's, that's your version of writing out 10 questions about college. You'll be surprised the amount of doors people open up for you. And if you're thinking about, let me read this next question, it, I, I found it really derails you. And I would say the one caveat to that is if you're doing a, if you're doing a steroids investigation and you're showing up at like an arms dealer's door, you probably do want the questions written out. That's pretty tense. You want to just like stick to the script. But if you're having a ranging conversation about the human side of football coaching with James Franklin, I would encourage you to think about topics more than specific questions. And then uh, I mean, the last thing I'll say is the most valuable question, which I told you a couple of people tonight. The most valuable question that I, that I find is when you have a good interview at the end, who else should I talk to? Because you got that, that person that just talked to you and gave you a good interview, they're going to want to help you out. And so I, 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 I can't believe the number of, it's almost like a, like, a, like a pyramid scheme, right? You talk to the high school coach who gives you the two other high school coaches and the one teammate that you should talk to. And then you talk to those three and you ask them the same thing. They give you one or two each. All of a sudden, you got your whole reporting tree of everybody you need to talk to. Um, and these are people that want to talk to you. And then also when you call that guy and say, hey, you know, so-and-so told me to give you a call, a lot of times they'll go, yeah, he told me he gave me your number. I'm ready to go. And I just found that to be such a valuable question. And you forget it sometimes that that might be the, like the, the big walk away valuable thing. So that, that, that's all my tips. I'm out. Maria, that's all you have. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk through a typical Ryan story, which is this great lead. So like the Grizzly Bear lead, I've only read it maybe twice, but I know that it's like, it begins like, 
you don't ever let your buddy bring her out in the woods, you never let your buddy step in bear crap. And so I can't remember their names, but you know, character X, that's why character X said and character Y, hey, watch it, there's bear shit here. And then the next line is, um, and the next line is, they were almost his last words. And so that's great because one of the great things you can do in a lead is put something at stake. So there's, you know, there's a bear attack, their lives are at stake. And then you talked about your great endings. You like there's a there's a punch that you, that goes out. In between, there can be all sorts of things, but I've noticed a couple of things, and maybe you can you can talk a little bit about them. Um, one is there's very often sort of a history section. There's like, hey, I'm a curious person, and like if we think about porta potties, if we think about bears, um, if we go back, we have a great line in the, in the grizzly bear story. If you're going to be a, there's a line that says if you're going to be a grizzly, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. You know, and it talks about all their attributes and all this sort of stuff. All this really interesting stuff about uh, an animal or, you know, porta potties or bowling balls that you didn't really think about before. But if you stop and actually have like a nice conversational piece on it, it's like, wow, that's actually really important to history that, you know, we had bathrooms. It allows us to have sit. You know, that, that sort of thing. And then, um, and then very often, and I think the most about the million dollar shot with this one, um, sort of the Dane law of, um, which means, you know, after the action is over, there's, it affects people. And you do a great job of showing us how it actually affected people. And I think that that's why we get so much of the humanity out of it. So I'm just curious about your thoughts on why do you do that? What are you, what are you going for? Um, you know, how, how did you start doing that? Any, anything you got? Well, one time I read on uh, the website, Old Deadspin. Did anybody read Deadspin old, years ago? It's an older site. It's under new management. But Old Deadspin, they used to call this trick in stories, they called it a Euro step, which if you follow basketball, this, do people know what a Euro step is in basketball? It's kind of that wild, like you take one step this way and then you jump this way with your second step. And I, like for, I'll use a different story. I did a story about this guy who built an exact replica of Ohio State's football stadium. It was like, uh, it's like a 250 pound Lego thing. It took him like five years. Um, and he is a uh, heart researcher. Like he's like a really advanced, he's like one of the best heart researchers doing research with live hearts. Well, I guess they're not live hearts, but hearts that were alive and, and function still. They were removed from people who passed away and um, donated to the school. And so he's like this leading heart researcher. So he's a very precise guy and he loves Legos. He took me down into his basement. Holy crap. Like you first you're like, man, this guy's got an issue. Like this is that. And then it's just like awesome. It's like it's like so awesome. Just Legos everywhere. Um hundreds of thousands of Legos. I think he, I forget how much he said his collection's worth, but it's like a million dollar Lego collection. But anyway, so he built this, he built this stadium and it took him four years. It's in the Ohio State um, library and it's an exact replica of the stadium with people in it and everything. And one of the, th the reason that I wanted to do this story, other than that's just kind of like a cool premise, is that he started selling for $50. You could buy four seats in the stadium and then put you, your mom, and dad, and your brother in there. And you would be, and the money all went to heart research for at Ohio State. And so he raised some money and it's in the library and it's a cool thing and everything. But the real, like, it was a cool story, but my Euro step at the end of the first section, I forget how I ended that first section, but. The second section begins with like a mini history about Legos. Where did they come from? And, and I started calling, there's people who are experts in toys. It's like <laughs> Google toy experts. And I found a bunch of guys, a bunch of people. And you start talking to them about toys. And it's just like this world of like, there's tons of lawsuits about toys. Like this guy, the one guy I talked to has been an expert witness in like 200 lawsuits. It's like basically his full-time job. He just gets flown all over the world to testify against Nerf, you know, or whatever. He was in the middle of a Nerf lawsuit because people rip toys off all the time. Like, there's a million different versions of Legos. Uh, but I wanted to write about Legos, and so the Euro step was just a history of this company. It's, you know, it's arguable, but like, this guy that I talked to that I think was a really good toy expert and testifies in all these lawsuits, 
He was like, Lego is the most successful toy ever made. I was like, wait a second, that can't be true. What about Barbie? What about Barbie? Actually, is probably back in the running here in the last year or two. But he made the case about Lego. Lego was dying as a company. And they made this licensing agreement in the 1990s that people were like, why did they do that? But it was to make Star Wars, Marvel, and a bunch of other things. So it revived the company. It's a billion, multi-billion dollar industry now. And it is on solid footing. Every generation, you know, your grandparents and my grandkids will all probably play with Legos. It'll have the stay the test of time. So I snuck that in. Like I like sneaking that in. It's kind of like vegetables in candy, right? Like you give them the candy of this guy doing heart research. And then I think I had a second Euro step in that, which is actually traveling, I guess, for real. But I had two Euro steps in the same story. But then I did a little section with, he was, he was telling me about heart research and how he, he was like, we understand about 70%, I think it was 70% of what makes a heart work. I was like, wait a second, I thought it was 100. Shouldn't it be 100? He was like, no, we still don't know sometimes why a heart shuts down or how we started back or why it didn't start up. And so they're still doing this research. I and mean, he took me in this lab. First I was in his basement with all these Legos. And then I'm in this lab where he had, I think, 40 human hearts that they were going to do, that they were going to cut up and do all these tests on. And so that was a double Euro step, which is illegal, I think. But I think I tried it. I did it. Statue number two. Yeah. <laughs> Not subject to video. Who's got a question? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier how uh, you did stand up comedy, and obviously your writing, uh, since what I've read, all has a lot of humorous undertones. I'm curious how you think writers should use those, like, precisely, not to go away from the point of a story, so it's just a joke. But to kind of add to what you're trying to say, to kind of hit on the human nature of the story. Hmm. That's a good question. You gotta do it in those. Like whether something's funny or not, I, I can't tell you another time I've been like, this is so funny. And then you say it in front of people and you're like, I'm never saying that out loud the rest of my life. That is the dumbest thing I've ever thought of. And and I've also had things that I think are really funny, and then my editor is like, that's not funny. And so it's like adjudicating what's funny and what's not is like you know, how many things, how many times have you thought something's hilarious and the guy sits aside and thinks it's dumb? You know, it's really hard. So it is really tricky, and I don't do it too much. But I would say, I'm gonna get personal for for a, for a second um, about why I I push to do a lot of the stories that I do is that um, you know I've written about this a little bit, but I I I'm an I'm a alcoholic and I'm a drug addict in recovery. I've been in recovery for a long time now, and um, one of the things when I went to rehab. Uh, I went to a, I would advise if you ever need to go to rehab, go to the crappiest one possible so that you're like, I don't ever want to be back here again. And so that's what I did. I went to a rough rehab and I've stayed sober ever since. And I just made this decision that I am going to find joy. I'm going to try to find joy in the way that I live my life and the things that I write about. And that's why I think a lot of my stories, I try to, you know, they're kind of goofy. The porta potty story is kind of goofy, you know, like who wants to, but I was like, let's go. Like, this is, it's funny, it's fun, it's important too, you know, like next festival you go to, see how it goes without any portable bathrooms at all. It's not good. Um, and so I really try to live my life that way where I try to see the joy and happiness in things. And at the end of the day, like sports, you can write about any serious topic in sports and you, and you should. But there's also, I watch, a, I watch sports a lot of times because they're just really, uh, um, fun and joyous and beautiful to watch. And so I try to capture that a lot in my stories. Of, I mean, that's not quite your question about humor, um, but I do try to like, I just, did, you know, I just remember thinking, a guy said this at rehab, he said, I did not get sober to be miserable. And so I didn't get sober to be miserable either. And so I try to lean that way and see the good in things. And so a lot of my stories do, I try to do more heartwarming stuff. I've done a few that are, you know, hard hitting, but for the most part, that's kind of the way I, I try to do it. I mean, if you can't read a sports story and laugh sometimes, I mean, that's not good. I, I kind of want to just ask you a little bit about because there's, there's a thing you do with description, like the bit in the Mahomes story where uh, Mahomes and his best friend look at each other in a way that, um, uh, in the way that best friends do. And 
the reason I just picked that out is I think it's a little, it can be a little confusing when you're starting out, and even when you're not starting out, of what do I feel confident enough to say without attributing it to someone, without it being a quote, just describing that moment, and obviously you weren't there for the moment. So can you just talk a little bit about how you discern that? And, and uh, That is really tricky to not, like, not be opinionated, but to have a perspective. I think there is a slight difference. Um, I get to this point sometimes with stories where I'm, I'll say things, I'll type things in, and I'll be like, I don't feel like I got the goods to be able to say that, you know? Um, but then I get to a point when I get into my 10th interview where I'm like, I know this story, and I'm going to say that. Um, I don't know. I definitely had people that disagree with my version of, like, how I describe um, a situation, but I, I'll say, like, listen, I talked to four other people, and this is what they saw, and it's... You know, the truth, it's, I mean, we were talking about, were we talking about the bystander effect? We were talking about the bystander effect earlier. But this idea of, like, if five of us all look at the same thing, we're going to see it, like, a little bit differently. And, and oftentimes, the person that you're writing about, Patrick Mahomes, for instance, he probably doesn't quite see it the exact way that everybody else did. He might have his own kind of version of the situation. And so... Um, so in that regard, I really try to do the best I can tell them the truth about what, what I think happened. But injecting your own, uh, it, it's not an opinion, like this person's good or this person's bad. Yeah, voice, voice. And I only feel comfortable when, with voice if I've really talked to a lot of people. Like, uh, And so that's when I, when I said that. But I do, I mean, I'm an I'm a old man. I'm an old ass man now. You know, I've been around the block, and um, you know, if you read my personal story, I've had, you know, amputations on my feet. I almost, you know, died at a Penn State football game basically many, many years ago. And you know, I've been to rehab. I've got kids now, and so I feel like I know some stuff. I feel like, and especially in the empathy realm, I really feel like I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. When I write about people, I try to to be empathetic, but also, you know, we do have an obligation. But if I write about, um, if I spent, let's, let's go back to James Franklin. It's a totally made up thing, but if I spend uh, four hours with James Franklin, you're going, to, you're going to want to kind of know what was it, what it, just what was it like when he walks into a room? What was he wearing? What, how does he talk? Does he talk fast or slow? And I guess you could say if you say um, somebody who talks really fast, like well, it's kind of opinionated or whatever. But um, I do think you do owe it to the reader to to answer that question, like, wow, what was that like, you know? Um, who's got a question out here? Yes. Yeah, um, thanks for bringing up what I, I was thinking about in class the other day. But just to, just to piggyback on that, I mean, you don't use a ton of quotes all the time. You don't use block quotes. A lot of times you write in present tense. Those kind of break a lot of the traditional rules of what we do. How did you come to your style? Oh you know, man, now that you say it, it sounds bad. It's against the rules. Uh, yeah, I do. I, you know, if you're writing a 5,000 word story about something, uh, I found that the stories where I have the least amount of reporting, I just like use big quotes, right? And that's an easy way to kind of get around it. Um, but when I talk to 10 people, first of all, when I talk to like 10 people about like Patrick Mahomes as a junior in high school, I like to like blend it all together rather than the coach just saying this one thing. I like to kind of like put it into my own words, and I think I do more justice to the actual truth of the story when I when I put it that way. And I the first drafts of my stories often do have long quotes in there. And I I unless it's really good, I try to cut it out of there. Because a lot of quotes are a pretty go-to thing. People want you want your you want quotes in stories. I mean, I had a story recently that I wrote where it was about these two guys. I can't say too much about it, but it was two main characters. And I, I wrote the whole story. It was like 5,000 words. And I went back through it. I was like, I didn't quote the one guy at all. And I was like, I don't want that either. Like, you want the guys, literally, you want the voice of the person in there. So, because you might have read it and been like, did he even talk to the other guy? Like, what did he do? So I went back through and I picked out his two or three best quotes. I do think you want the person's actual voice in there, but I haven't even thought about that very much, but I do try to prune the best quotes. I mean, you hate to say it this way, because I think that you're not learning this in Com 260, 
but um, sometimes you can say it better than the person. I, I have a lot of I have a lot of quotes from people that are uh, B minus description of something that happened, and it's like I can say it a little bit better. It's just a fact, and then I'll I'll use the second half of the quote or something like that. But I do I. It's interesting you bring it up. I haven't even actually really thought about crap. I made more quotes in my stories. Thank you. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to sorry. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good thought. It's good. You do want your people in there. You know, like that's the point of it, right? Is to talk to them and get their quotes in there. So but I do try to just only use the you want like hundred mile an hour fastball quotes, man. If you're writing a five thousand word story, three thousand word story, that like you really want the best of the best. I've written a lot of game stories where it's like you want the other coach. You, the best quote you get from the other coach, you gotta have it in there. And I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I definitely think that's the case. And uh, I know you're writing about unconventional stories. And some of them are probably easy sells. I mean, it's easy to sell a story about packing your house. I am curious to hear about the conversation you had with your editor when you said, I want to write a story about the court. Yeah, that was a fun conversation. And the first draft, I got some feedback on the first draft, because there were some things in that first draft where my editor was like, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. We work for Disney, dummy. This is not printing, you know? So that was the hardest conversation was getting that out of there. I, you know, they trust me a lot. I love, I love ESPN. I love working there. I, I think we do great stuff, and I get a lot of opportunities. And I made the case, I think I talked to a bunch of bathroom experts before I actually went to Fortify, and I wanted to make the case that, like, it sounds ridiculous, but we can't have sports. We can't have Taylor Swift concerts. We can't have fall festivals. We can't have big protests. We can't have any large gathering of people without portable bathrooms. In many states, you literally cannot. There's laws that if you have over 40 people, you have to have a portable bathroom available for that. And so I went to them and was just like, part one of having a huge sporting event is scheduling the event. Part two is where the people can go to the bathroom at. And so I made the case with all of these experts kind of talking about the foundation of modern American society is, do we have bathrooms? And they were like, okay, if you want to hang out in Buffalo with Porta Potty all day, and I don't know if any people read that story, but there's like five things in that story that made it in that are just <laughs> that are horrible. There's things I saw that I will never unsee. Um, I told someone a class today that um, what they do at, in the first half of an NFL game is, it's called a half suck, where they, each guy has like 15 to 20 porta potties, and he has about 90 seconds to suck as much out of there as possible, refill the bowl, clean the bowl, fill up the hand sanitizer or the soap, and replace the toilet paper, and then also get all the trash out of there. And think of that's a fast 90 seconds. This guy was like a NASCAR pit crew guy. But he said to me, You're gonna see disgusting stuff today, Ryan. Like, it's gonna be bad. But nothing, nothing come close. To when I fired this hose up, I was like, "How bad can it be, right?" And it's a it's a thousand gallon tank that shoots a blast of hot air out before it starts vacuuming. And so when he started it up, I got this warm blast of air, and it just smelled like someone could cook diapers for like a month. And it was so warm, and it, it, I like shiver. Oh my god! And it went like in my nose and took over my brain. And I started gagging. I have audio of me just like, I was like dying. And I'll never forget there was a guy, a Bills fan, beside me in Zuba's pants. Do people know what Zuba's are? Those obnoxiously striped pants. There was a drunk guy standing there beside me. He fires it up, and the hot air, hot crap air hits us both at the same time. And I start gagging, and I see him. He just, he just runs. He just, he's just gone. It was just like that's disgusting, and he sprints away, and he's just like gone into the into nowhere. And so that's what I had to say. when I came back. I had about twenty five anecdotes like that that some made it in and some didn't. But my editors were like, "Go do it." It cost like a thousand dollars, right? I got a hotel for a couple nights and got a rental car and drove to Buffalo. And so they were just like, "This is a lottery ticket." I've definitely had things that don't pan out, but that one they were just like. They were definitely dubious, and then my first draft had multiple things that were just, they weren't like R-rated, but they were the most repulsive. Like I saw, I mean, people, the point of Porta Potties is I'm going in and I'm coming out as fast as possible, and I don't care if you're next. This, like, whatever I need to do is going to happen, and I, I'm done with that for the day. And so, like the other anecdote that I, didn't, that I used earlier at lunch, which I think some people were getting sick of, 
There was a quarter pie they put police tape around, like, like this crime scene, don't go in there. And I just was like, my journalistic duty, sir, is to allow me into this quarter pie. And so this guy was like, okay, it's, it's not good in there. And so he opened it up and it was, the problem was, I don't even know how someone vomited the way that they did. It was up the walls and then it was like the plastic roof, which is like a good seven feet high maybe. And I told someone earlier today, it looked like a little kid started vomiting and then people started throwing the kids and so I had a sprinkler puke all over. And so they, they just they just taped it up and, and the guy that I was with had to come back a couple days later and deal with that. He had to go in with a power washer and clean it out. And so there's a long way to answer. It, they gave me a lot of rope and I came back and we went through a lot of drafts, but um, but it ended up only semi-disgusting. <laughs> I have five more, I'll tell you after this, and you'll never stop thinking about it. Here's what we're going to do, because we're, um, we're actually getting beyond our views. What we're going to do is go lightning round. So keep the question tight. And Brian, try to answer in two minutes or less. Yeah. And, and, we're, and we'll do like, no, like, like five of us on one word. Here we go. All right, great question. How do you avoid everything from the bank? Uh, I think I have to choose topics that are just so. I do ball and balls. I mean, there's just no way to get formulaic. Like, I do think I get formulaic. Like, I do worry about that. You're right. Like it's like, oh, a weird thing happens. A weird guy finds something. Cool. Like I might write ten more of those. The truth is, the the ceiling, the 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 basement, the, the downside to that is like I just write a bunch of really weird stories that are all kind of the same, but they're all the parts and gives shit. Um. You talked a little bit about your personal history and your ESPN bios and that you're a big advocate for coverage of people with disabilities and addictions. So how do you make sure there is more coverage in that uh, realm, especially in this <coughs> where we you know, think of everyone as healthy and able-bodied? As yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, I'm proud of ESPN's role in like Paralympics and Special Olympics, and I, we cover those events. Cover them a lot, and I love that. Um, at our company, we have a pretty advanced style guide on how to talk about. It's very complicated. The wording to use. I mean, the AP style book is like five times as long now as it used to be because it's really you have to be really careful with your word choices. And there's a bunch of words that I use to describe myself that I would not. If you said you all said the same exact, I lost the ends of both feet. Both both feet. I lost all my toes. So ends of both feet are amputated. So I have a blue accessible parking, like I say handicap parking, you shouldn't say that, it's accessible, accessible parking permit, I still say that. So um, I do a lot of stuff, uh, people just send me stories and say, am I describing this the right way? And I try to I try to help out with that. Writing about addiction also is kind of in the same bucket, it can be really, really tricky. People still treat it as like, why don't you just stop? You know, it's like, yeah, asshole, I already thought of that, it didn't work, you know? And so I try to, um, so I, I try to like really advocate for that. At the same time, I don't I don't um, push some of those stories are really I don't push someone. Please tell me about how you got sober. It's a very personal thing. Like that was a very like thing. Yeah. Yeah. You talk you know, a little bit about the importance of the start and finish uh, of a story. Um, what's the key to keeping things interesting for both the story that you're writing? I heard of, uh, we had a guy teach, he taught interviewing at ESPN for a long time. I think he's a brilliant guy, but he said the most valuable question is, and then what happened? And so I think a lot of my stories are like, and then what happened? I did recently hear the guys um, who, who write South Park who were like, your story should be nothing. If you boiled your story down, it should be like, this thing happened, but then this happened. And then this thing happened, but then this thing also happened. The idea of like, but then this happened. The idea that it's like, it's not just a linear, it's not just a linear thing, there's twists and turns. So I try to, he did, he mentioned it a little bit earlier, the end of, I I have a, I have section breaks in my stories. I, I try to not have too many because it can be a lazy thing to fall back on. So I'll just end it, start again, in the middle of the story. Try to not do it too much, but the last line has to be really good. It has to be really good. I don't always get there. A friend of mine called it a hammer line. He was like, you gotta have better hammer lines. But like, if you can say not this exact line, but then, but something like, uh, he had no idea what was gonna happen next. You know, that's kind of lame. But you want something like that, like, oh shit, I better go to the next section. 
So I try to do that a lot in the middle. But it's a good question. It's hard. Um, what would you say is the most important thing you do to prepare for writing a story during the process? Well, I'll tell you, I usually don't talk to the person I'm writing about until like, I would try to make the last person. There's certain stories that, like, you know, if you have an athlete who's dad passed away and you want to write about how that felt, you can't write that story if the athlete says, I don't want to talk about it. You can't, you can't put all those kinds of things in as well. But what happens for me is I try to work my way in. I like to be able to go to an, uh, an athlete or a coach and say, I talked to 14 guys from that team, and I would like to talk to you now. And at that, at that point, um, you know, you kind of work your, you've earned your, you've earned your, your credit with that guy. Um, does that answer your question? What was exactly your question again? Yeah, like, what, what do you do to prepare, uh, to prepare for the story? So I always find the fringe, the fringe view. I try to find a high school coach of a football player before I try to call the Bills and get Josh Allen. So that's how I, I literally did that, where you talk to all of the people and work away. So when I say, so I prepare, I usually read a lot about them. I usually spend a couple hours reading about them. And I just write names down, like I should call this person, this person, this person. And it's never the athlete's mom or dad or somebody that close to them. I try to like really build up to, here's the case for why you should talk to me. I already talked to these other seven people. So that's fine. We're gonna do the last question. I just want to say one thing. Ryan, tomorrow, if you didn't get to talk to him and you want to, and he's great, you can see he's pretty approachable too. Um, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., in the atrium of the Ellisville Media Center. We're gonna have like punch and cookies type reception celebrating 20 years of Curly Center. And uh, Ryan will be around and just hang around. So, so come up and just say hi and talk to him. Um, really invite you all to do that and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So and with that, our last question. I was kind of wondering what happened because um, it says that you were a senior editor and that now you're back to being a full-time writer. Why did you go back to full-time writing? Uh, okay, so this is another personal story. So I, I started out at ESPN as a as a writer reporter as like a, as like a 22 year old, and um, you know, long story short, I kind of blew it. I started having surgeries on my feet. I had one surgery after another after another, and I got pretty wrapped up in the opioid world and drug and alcohol. And after a couple of years, I was just like not performing well as an employee. And they said, you, you know, would you we'd like to try as an editor? You know, I was kind of starting from scratch. Here. So I started out as an editor, and I went to rehab, and I got sober, and I turned my life around, and that helped me turn around um, my professional life, too. And so after, like, 10 years as an editor, I really got this feeling of, I read the, I read this study about, um, oh, man, this is going to work. Sorry, this is going to go off on a deep end a little bit. I read this study about, like, they did this massive study with uh, people who are over the age of 80. They asked them to write down what their biggest regrets in life were. And it was the same couple of things, almost universally. One was spend more time with your kids. One, another one was like, don't be, be nicer to your kids. And the other one was almost every person over the age of 80 says, I had this thing I really wanted to do and I just never tried. I had too many responsibilities. I had this, I had that. I was in debt. I never tried and I wish I had. And so I was like reading this and I was thinking, boy, you know, writing was always my life, you know? And so... I started advocating, like, hey, I, I'd like to try to write. Like, I, I just, I don't even care if I fail. I don't even care if I bomb out. I want to be able to, I want to be 80 and take that survey and not say that. And so I started advocating for that. I, I think I was not even a full time writer when they let me do the porta potty thing. So I was like out of the office for a couple of days. I'm hanging out in portable bathrooms, guys. Uh, but I started writing in addition to my editor responsibilities. I've done a lot of good work as an editor, I think, with great writers at ESPN. But um, eventually in uh, March, so I've been on contract for a year and a half. I've only really been writing for full time for a year and a half now. They gave me an opportunity to say, go for it. And so far it's gone pretty good. But the point of all of that is just like, you probably already are thinking like, I got all these responsibilities, I got these bills. I always wanted to live in Paris for six months, but I probably can't. Are you sure? I would ask yourself, are you sure? And I, I tried to ask myself, I was, I mean, I was also having a midlife crisis. I mean, I guess that's the answer. Midlife crisis got me here, but I've only been writing for a while, and it was because I wanted at least be able to just say, I chased it, and I worked or didn't. And I just want to say, in small world print, I read that same study like two months before Penn State called and said, do you want to come run a sports journal? 
Wow. Really? True story. Wow. A couple old guys just live like Christ. Just sitting around. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> um, okay. Thank you so much for coming out. Let's give Ryan a big round. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Beautiful. Thanks.